that you will be edified as we study God's Word. Uh, we uh, appreciate the McCormicks and the Bratchers for uh, desiring to be a part of our number, and we hope that we can encourage them and they can us as well. I was encouraged by the number of those as uh, people were walking out this morning who said, we did in fact miss you, Chris, while you were gone. Uh, of course, the rule goes into effect that my wife instituted many years ago, which is flowers don't mean as much if I have to ask for them. Um, when I have to get in the pulpit and say, some of you said you missed me, and then others of you then say that you missed me, it's just not the same. Um, it seems like it has to be solicited. Um, so, uh, regardless. Now, some of you also said that you missed my jokes. And I told a few while I was uh, away, and uh, some were appreciated more than others. Um, so I, I, I thought, since it was uh, requested, that I, I was obligated to uh, tell a few today. Uh, what do you call a business that puts out just okay products? A satisfactory. What did the janitor say when he jumped out of the closet? Supplies! <laughs> Get that one? Okay. Um, we'll move on. I just, yeah, it, it was requested, so I felt I was obligated to, uh, to present that. Um, nobody said they missed my jokes, the, the folks upstairs have told me. Um, well, they weren't there. And uh, the, the video has no audio, so they can't prove that. Um, so... Uh, during the meeting this, this last week, I was in uh, Fulton, Mississippi, but I was preaching in a different congregation, at the Gum Congregation, and I, I messaged the preacher there a few weeks prior, and I said, uh, if there's anything in particular you would like me to talk about while I'm there, I'd be happy to do so. And he sent me back a list of questions that were submitted, and I thought, well, that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll get some things together for, about those questions. And... Um, in the course of coming up with those sermons over the last, I don't know, two, three weeks or month, I, I messaged the preacher back and I said, I'm just wondering, were these questions from various members or only from one member? And he said, yes. <laughs> so I didn't really know what that meant. And then uh, when I got there, I said just about exactly what I just told you, and everybody in the congregation looked at one woman. And I realized then that everything that I was going to preach that week had come from one member of the congregation that she had requested. I suppose that Brady, the preacher, had said, if anybody has questions, and she submitted a list. <laughs> and so, essentially, she dictated the whole series of, of lessons this week. But they were good lessons, and I highly, or, or they were good suggestions. You'll determine if some of them were good lessons. Um, and I thought they, they turned out really well. And... For one of those questions, um, I went about answering it in a, what, I seem, uh, to, what I think is in a sort of an unusual way. And that's the sermon that we have before us this evening. Uh, the question was related to Romans chapter 9. And in particular, the passage uh, near the middle or end of Romans chapter 9, in which Paul begins to talk about the potter and the clay. In verse, number tw in verse number 19 of Romans chapter 9, Paul writes, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou? That repliest against God, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Uh, this is one of the primary passages that people go to in an attempt to prove that God chooses before we're born who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. A, a doctrine known as election, right? That God chooses before uh, we are even born for some people to be lost and for other people to be saved. And so this woman asked me to clarify Romans chapter 9 in the context of that misunderstanding. Uh, now, that, pat, that belief isn't as popular as it used to be, but it is the foundation of something that is still quite popular in our world today. And so what I sought out to do was to answer that, to clarify Romans chapter 9, but in the process to also answer this question. How do we go about understanding difficult passages? 
And, and that really is an important question to consider because there are difficult passages in the Bible. We'll notice that as a fact in just a moment. And, and so what I sketched out was an approach to Romans chapter 9 that would not only work for Romans chapter 9, but that I, will believe, I believe will work for any passage that we might find difficult in our Bibles today. And so that's what we're going to do tonight is we're going to sort of trace that a process of dealing with difficult passages. And we really do need to start, I think, with history. And we'll deal with that word tulip up there in a moment. But I've said it before here. I've said it in Bible studies one-on-one -on -one before. And really this, I think, is one of the fundamental problems that people have when they approach the Bible. And it has to do with history. See, ideally, you and I need to approach the Bible from what I call the deserted island philosophy. In other words, we need to try to rid ourselves of any preconceived ideas, any pre-programmed beliefs before we approach the Word of God because many of the misunderstandings about the Bible come because we already have our mind made up about a certain issue and instead of going according to what the Bible reveals, we try to find in the Bible the things that we want to be there. Imagine, though, if we were on a deserted island and we had never read the Bible. All we knew is that the Bible is inspired. But we had never been, been, uh, been confronted with its message. We had never been indoctrinated in any sort of fashion. And all of a sudden, one day, the Bible washes up on shore and we read it having never had any contact with it whatsoever. The way that we would read the Bible there is the way, ideally, that we need to approach it, correct? With an open mind, wanting it to, uh, to clarify its own ideas, wanting it to justify its own message, rather than trying to insert in it what we think should be there. And as it relates to Romans chapter 9, I'm convinced that the problems that we have with this passage wouldn't be had to as great a level if we could deprogram all of the historical things associated with this idea. And so we have to start with what we see in front of us. That is the tulip doctrine. The tulip doctrine is at the core of, of a good deal of denominational ideas. And it goes something like this. First of all, man is born in sin. What's termed total hereditary depravity. That is, man, because of the original sin of Adam and Eve, and because of the sinfulness of our own physical bodies, we are born incapable of ultimately doing good. And in fact, of doing the best good, which is submitting to God's will and obedience. We are incapable of that. Because by our heredity, we are completely depraved. That's total hereditary depravity. Now that has been the core doctrine of maybe the majority of religious belief for literally centuries. Obviously, however, it's not a core foundation of actual Bible teaching. Many people approach the Bible just assuming that this is true. And so they make assumptions on other things based on that. Well, John Calvin, along with others, and you might lump Martin Luther in there and others as well, in an effort to sort of organize these ideas, said, well, if man is totally depraved, then they aren't capable, man's not capable of approaching God on his own, so God has to bring people to him. God chooses to save certain people. And if He chooses to save certain people, then of necessity He chooses other people not to be saved. And that's a doctrine known as unconditional election. God chooses before we're born who will be saved and who will be lost, separate and apart from your merits. He may choose Marion to be saved and Connie to be lost, even though those of us who know them know that it should be reversed, if anything. But God chooses that before we are born. Not based on our merit, because after all, we are all totally, hereditarily depraved. And so God has to bring us to Him by His will and not our own. Unconditional election. Well, 
When you consider the, the, the idea, the belief that God chooses who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, it seems wasteful, doesn't it, that Jesus would die for all of humanity. Because not all of humanity is going to be saved. So would Jesus die for people whom God knew would be lost? The answer according to the Tulip Doctrine is no. Which brings us to number three, limited atonement. Jesus only died, in fact, for the elect. He did not die for all of humanity. He only died for those whom God had chosen to be saved. He died for the elect. Now you won't find that anywhere in Scripture. But it's a logical necessity if you're going to believe in unconditional election. An unconditional election is a logical necessity if you're going to believe in total hereditary depravity. Well, if God chooses who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, well, you can't resist God, can you? You can't say, I'm sorry, God, I know you chose me before I was born to be saved, but I don't want to be saved. So that means God's grace is irresistible. You cannot go against God's choice. If God chooses you to be saved, you're saved whether you want to be or not. If God chooses you to be lost, you're lost whether you want to be or not. And so irresistible grace. Notice how these things are logically connected. And then all of this culminates with what is known as the perseverance of the saints. Or as you might more commonly know it, once you're saved, you're always saved. Because if God chooses who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, because we're all total, totally hereditarily depraved anyway, and Jesus Christ only died for the elect, and you can't resist God's grace, well, if He chooses you to be saved, you're saved. And there's nothing you can do to be lost. And consequently, the reverse would be the, ca the case as well. All of this fits into what we would broadly term as Calvinism. Now, you might be hard-pressed to find people who believe in every tenet of the Tulip Doctrine now. Many people have sought to reject this idea of unconditional election, even if they keep the rest of it. And if they knock out unconditional election, they usually throw out limited atonement too. Many people you run into are what they may term three-step Calvinists. In other words, they believe that we're all depraved even from birth. And they believe that you cannot resist God's grace and that once you're saved, you're always saved. But they don't believe in the, in the unconditional election aspect of it. But the problem with that is you can't just choose and pick which parts you want to have and which you want to reject. The reason that these were designed to begin with is because logically they all must exist in order for the system to have any logical uh, sense about it at all. But in our, for our purposes this evening, we're going to focus in particular on the idea of unconditional election. You see, because I'm convinced that the reason we have a problem with Romans 9 at all is because of unconditional election. And the idea that people have... have uh, have postulated over the years that God chooses who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Now, I said in the gospel meeting that we don't have time to deal with this in a complete way. And that's not entirely true because I guess if y'all wanted to stay for two or three hours, we absolutely would have time. So the true statement is we don't want to make time to go through every argument against this, but let's just uh, touch the hem of the garment, perhaps. Go with me, for instance, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, and I want you to understand just how easy it is um, with, a, with a complete understanding of the Scriptures to, to really throw out the idea of unconditional election. In verse 1, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. And then verse 2 makes a really interesting statement. By which also you are what? Saved. So if, if we're using the deserted island philosophy, and you open up your Bibles, and you read through, and you get to 1 Corinthians 15, and somebody asks you, how are you saved? Would you say, I'm saved by God choosing before I'm born that I'm saved? Or would you say, I'm saved how? By the gospel. See, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 clearly says we're saved by the gospel. And it also tells us that our salvation is conditional, which means we can have it and lose it. Continue reading in verse 2. By which also you are saved, and then this next word hits us really hard. If. If you keep in memory what I've preached unto you unless you believed in vain. You see, it doesn't take a PhD in theology. 
to understand that we're not saved by God picking and choosing who's going to be saved before we're born. The New Testament, from cover to cover, teaches us that we're saved by some response that we have to the Gospel. And that it's conditional on us continuing to follow its direction. And that's just 1 Corinthians 15. And that took no real exegesis on my part, just reading the text as it's written. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. In Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the elect. No, you read Romans 1.16, it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. Not to those whom God chooses before they're born, but to those who respond to the gospel message, those who believe it. That, that's so drastically different than the doctrine we just said. 1 Peter chapter 1. And again, these require no real exegesis. And, and that will come into play in just a moment if you'll follow with me. About halfway through this sermon, I wanted to make sure that people still were with me. And I said, we're going to get to Romans chapter 9. By the way, it'll take us a while tonight to get to Romans chapter 9. And I noticed that some people were, were kind of looking at me side-eyed like, where's Romans chapter 9? And I said, imagine we were in Fulton, Mississippi and Tupelo is 30 miles to the west. And I said, imagine that we went from Fulton to Tupelo via Florida. Well, that's what we're doing tonight. Um, well, that, that's kind of how we're approaching this, but there's a, a meaning behind the madness, and I hope you'll follow along and that you can understand as we do that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And now jump down to verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls, how? By obeying the truth. Who does the purifying? We do. When we obey the truth, we actively purify our souls. We have a part to play in our salvation. God doesn't choose it before we're born that we're going to be saved. And we have nothing to say about it because God's grace is irresistible. We make a conscious decision to purify our souls by obeying the truth. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So, that's just a splattering of all the many, many passages in the New Testament that remind us that our salvation is based not on some random choice by God before we're born, but on our reaction to the Gospel. So I wanted to start there for this reason. The next thing that we need to really have in our armament if we're going to understand difficult Bible passages is this one main point of Bible interpretation. And if we don't know anything else about Bible interpretation, we need to know this. Difficult passages should be understood in light of plain passages. That is one of the most common sense approaches to Bible study that any of us can undertake. What so often people do is they say, I have a doctrine. And then they find a difficult Bible passage and they twist it to use to justify their belief. And what they fail to realize or, or fail to stop to, to think about is that there might be 20 plain passages that disprove what they concluded from that difficult passage. And what they've therefore done is put the Bible at odds with itself. We must first understand plain passages in order to understand difficult ones. Dear friends, if you get a call from a friend of yours that says, I've come up with something new in the Bible, somehow lovingly direct them back to the Word of God. Because what so often, I, I've, I've had preacher friends call me up and say, hey, I just found something out in the Bible. I've never seen it before. And, and I've never heard anybody teach this. All of a sudden, my radar goes, whoop. What is it that you've learned? And from what difficult passage did you get it? Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be closed-minded. Quite the opposite. The, the deserted island view says we're open-minded. 
But we don't go to the Bible seeking to find something new from difficult, convoluted passages of Scripture. Are there difficult passages in the Bible? Absolutely not. I'm just joking. There are difficult passages in the Bible. Did you know that the Bible even remarks that there are difficult passages in it? Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 if you don't mind. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter is in a discussion about the last days and about what will happen and about patience. I'd like you to pick up with me in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. And then he says this, Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as in also all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. He says Paul talked about salvation and long-suffering. But then I want you to continue in verse 16, in which are some things, what? Hard to be understood. Peter says, some of Paul's writing is hard to understand. But then notice what he continues to say. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other Scriptures, those that aren't difficult, unto their own destruction. What happens? People take difficult passages and they twist them even if they run contrary to plain passages. Now there's something as a side note from 2 Peter chapter 3. I find it very encouraging that even in the first century, Peter knew that Paul's epistles were inspired. Did you catch that? What did he call Paul's epistles? He called them Scripture. Someone with a Jewish background wouldn't use the word Scripture loosely. When he said in Paul's writings and the other Scripture... That's no good. Is it back? I'm back. All right. Some of you started squirming. I couldn't hear myself, which generally is a good thing, but uh, was not so good in that moment. All right. So we recognize that there are difficult passages, but we must understand difficult passages in light of plain ones. Let's go back to the deserted island philosophy. The Bible washes up on shore and you read all the way through the Bible about how you have to respond to the saving message. You read the Great Commission. You read the book of Acts. And you read all about how people responded to the message and were saved. And then you get to Romans 9. And it talks about the potter and the clay. Would you immediately say, forget everything I've already read. God must choose before we're born who's going to be saved and who's going to be saved. You wouldn't jump to that because there are so many plain passages that have already told us how we're saved. But if you start at Romans 9 wanting to find election, you'll find it if you twist the Scriptures. So we've learned already two things about approaching difficult passages. Number one, we've got to be careful what history we bring to the table. Number two, we've got to understand plain passages before we seek to understand difficult ones. Those are two of the most important things that you and I can understand if we're to approach difficult passages of the Scriptures like Romans chapter 9. By the way, who wrote Romans chapter 9? Paul did. And Peter said some of his stuff's hard. And so we recognize that. The Bible prepared us for that. Now, history, interpretation. Now we're getting to the book of Romans, but not Romans chapter 9 specifically yet. Because here's the next point. If you and I are going to understand a particular passage, we must understand it in the context in which it was written. And that is especially true of a book like Romans. For instance, you could go to Ephesians chapter 5 and you could read Paul's instruction for the husband and wife and you could read it in a vacuum and get a lot out of it. Because Ephesians deals with several different ideas in sort of a topical way, much like Colossians. They're parallel. Romans is not like the book of Ephesians. 
Romans is a thesis on one main idea. And if you jump in the middle of that, you're going to be lost. Not lost spiritually, although it might take you that direction, but you're going to be lost in terms of what the thing's talking about. Because it's not as if Paul sat down and said, let me write Romans 1 and let it stand alone. Let me write Romans 2 and let it stand alone. No. He wrote it as one unit, meant to be understood as a unit. If you were to look at Romans 1 through 16, the entire book, from a bird's eye view, what you would notice is that the end of chapter 11 begins with a four-letter word, Amen. And then Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, I therefore, and he goes on with what turns out to be a very practical discussion from chapter 12 all the way through chapter 16. There's a dividing line between 1 1 through 11 and 12 through 16. So what we're going to do now is we're going to drive through the state of Florida and we're going to say, what is 1 through 11? Okay, I'm going to give you a one statement description of each chapter of Romans 1 through 11. You ready? You going to buckle in? On your mark, get set, go. Romans chapter 1, the Gentiles are in sin. Now we don't have time, we do, but you don't want to take time to get into proving this statement about each passage. But if you look at Romans 1, what does it say? Uh, That the creation tells us about God. That when we look at the creation, His attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made. What's that? Uh, About the middle of Romans chapter 1? And then he goes on to describe the sins of the Gentile world, doesn't he? How they, they did things that were against nature, gave into such sins as homosexuality, men with men, women with women. He goes on in Romans chapter 1. He, he goes on to describe adultery, idolatry, all of those Gentile sins. So in Romans chapter 1, he says, Gentiles, you are in sin without Christ. That's chapter 1. Now in chapter 2, there's a change. Thematically, he says not only, Ro- not only Jew- Gentiles rather are in sin, but verse 1 of chapter 2, therefore thou art inexcusable. And then he uses this phrase, O oh man. That's a Jewish greeting. So he goes from Gentiles chapter 1 to Jews in chapter 2. And you know what his conclusion is about the Jews? Yeah, you're in sin too. Can you imagine being a Jewish Christian and somebody stands up in the congregation at Rome to read Paul's epistle? And as they go through chapter 1, the Jewish Christian is saying, Yeah, Paul, you get those Gentiles. You let them have it. And then you read chapter 2 and verse 1 and the Jewish Christian says, Wait, what? You're talking about me too? And so in Romans 1 he says the Gentiles are under sin. In in Romans chapter 2 he says the Jews are under sin. And if you know Romans 3.23, you know what chapter 3 says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 says, in fact, it's not just Jews and Gentiles, but all are in sin. But let's stop here for just a moment and let's see what is the point of Romans so far. The Jewish nation is in sin without Christ. The Gentile nation is in sin without Christ. That's Romans 1 and 2. Romans 3, every person of every nation is in sin without Christ. We're not talking in Romans 1 and following about individuals being chosen. We're talking about national identities, Jew and Gentile. That's the context of Romans chapter 1. From Romans 3 to Romans 4 are some of the most misunderstood and misapplied passages in all of the New Testament. Martin Luther locked himself in his tower and he came out with what history calls the Tower Discovery. And the Tower Discovery was essentially Romans 3 and 4 teaches that we're saved by faith only. He even put the word only in Romans chapter 3, but it's not there in the original. We are saved by faith apart from the deeds of the law. But what law is he talking about in Romans 3 and 4? He mentions one particular act of the law, circumcision. Romans 3 and 4 is talking about the Old Testament law. And Romans 4 gives us the conclusion, the Old Testament law will not save us. You can't go to the Old Testament and find salvation. That is a slap in the face to the Jewish Christian who believed they were saved as a peculiar people, as Jews, and then they could transition into the Christian faith from Judaism. And many of them believed the Gentiles to be saved had to transition to Judaism and then to Christianity. Because you had to be a Jew to be saved. 
Paul says the Old Testament law has no power to save us. No power. That's the end of Romans 3 and on into chapter 4. Romans chapter 5. Christ alone saves us. While we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the culmination of Romans chapter 5. And then he goes on to talk about as an Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. The gist of Romans chapter 5 is there's only one power to save and it's Jesus Christ. Not the Old Testament system, not the pagan religions of the world. Only Christ can save us. We might, if we were singing songs uh, sprinkled throughout this sermon, pause here and sing, In Christ alone. Because that's the gist of Romans chapter 5. Christ alone saves. Romans chapter 6 continues that idea. Did you know that Christ saves to such an extent that you have to be in Christ to be saved? No, you're not. As, that so many of us as have been baptized into Christ are baptized into His death. And then we should not be the servants of sin, but the servants of righteousness because we are in Christ. That's Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 7 is perhaps the most, one of the most difficult passages in the book of Romans. And there are discussions as to what really Romans 7 is talking about. Let me give you my take on Romans chapter 7. It's talking about how the Old Testament law had absolutely no way to provide hope of salvation ultimately without Christ. In Romans chapter 7, here's the conclusion. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7 if you will. And I want you to look at verse 24. Here's the conclusion of Romans 7. Paul makes this conclusion. He talks about growing up as a Jew all through Romans 7 and how the law could do nothing but point out sin. Uh, and now I want you to look at verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Under the Old Testament law, what's the answer? Nobody. There's nothing to save me from the body of this death. Ultimately, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. That Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us of that. But verse 25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, in Romans chapter 7, he says, I grew up a Jew under the old law, and all it could do was teach me that covetousness was sinful. It couldn't once and for all remove that sin from my account. So notice the emphasis. The Old Testament system can't save me. The pagan religious system can't save me. Being a national Jew won't save me. Being a national Gentile won't save me. In Romans chapter 8, if there's hopelessness under the old law, chapter 8 tells us there is hope under the new law. There is therefore now, this is Romans 8 and verse 1, no condemnation to those who are what? To those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then verse 2 reminds us that the New Testament is a law. To those of you who say we are not under law, to those of you who might hear people say, we're not under law. It says, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We're under a law, it's just a different law. It's not the old law. It's the law of the new covenant. The law of Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, that brings us to Romans chapter 9. I don't believe that we can understand Romans 9 without going through all of this. And now in Romans chapter 9, here is the gist, and we'll revisit this in just a moment. Being a member of national Israel, that's not going to save you. It's not. And he's already addressed that in Romans chapter 2. Jews are under sin. In chapter 3, all are under sin. In Romans 4, the Old Testament can't save you. In Romans 7, it can't provide you ultimate hope. And so in Romans 9, he, he sees the Jews would say, but wait a minute, we are God's people. You see, there was with this, this national Jewish uh, 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 heritage the belief that because they were Jews, Jews nationally, God owed them salvation. That the Jews believed that. And Paul is saying in Romans chapter 9, I don't care if you're a Jew or not. God has the right to choose a nation or a group of people to be the ones through whom He displays His glory. 
And many years ago, he chose national Israel. But he could just as easily choose somebody else. And he did choose somebody else in the New Covenant. Who is it? The church. You see, so Romans 9 tells us being a part of national Israel doesn't matter anymore. And it's not going to automatically save you. In Romans chapter 10, he builds on that to say, but wait a minute, even Jews can be saved. Just because you're national Israel doesn't mean you're automatically saved, but it also doesn't mean you're automatically lost. In fact, in Romans 11, he expounds on that and says specifically, Jews can be saved. That's the first part of chapter 11. And then he has to, uh, to tuck this in at the end of this section because he's been talking to Jews a good bit in Romans 1 through Romans 10. And in case the Gentile Christian would say, you know, I thought I was better than that Jewish Christian beside me. He says at the end of chapter 11, but Gentile, just because God has disavowed Israel as a nation, it doesn't mean Gentile that you're better than that Jew. You see, we can't fully appreciate the societal gap that existed between a Gentile Christian sitting next to a Jewish Christian. We can't understand that. But in the first century, it was very real. That Jewish Christian absolutely believed that he was better than that Gentile Christian. That he had a greater and deeper relationship with God because he was a Jew. And so if Paul has to tell him he's not any better, automatically that Gentile would say, see, I'm better. And Paul would say, no, 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 wait a minute. We're all on the same footing in the New Testament. And really, that's the gist of Romans 1-11. through 11. And we can't understand Romans 9 without understanding that, which brings us to the text. I told you it was going to take a long trip to get there. But here we are. Being Israel, national Israel, will not automatically save you, and he uses four illustrations in Romans 9 to prove that. The first one is, is the illustration of Abraham in chapter 9 verses 7 and 8. And quickly, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. You know, he makes this point. For those Jews who think because they're the seed of Abraham it means they're special, what about Ishmael? Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, but who did God choose? He chose Isaac. Did his choosing of Isaac mean that Ishmael was lost? You know what the answer to that is? No. God didn't choose Isaac for salvation. He chose him to be his nation through whom Christ would come so that everybody could be saved. You see, Romans 9 is not talking about individual salvation. It's talking about national choosing. Jew versus Gentile on a national level. Illustration number two. Not only is he talking about, not only does he mention Abraham, rather, he mentions Jacob and Esau. And he makes this statement, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And the the one who believes in, in election will say, see there, God chose Jacob, and he just kicked Esau to the curb. That's true nationally. By choosing Jacob to be the seed line of promise, did he condemn Esau to condemnation? No. This is national choosing has nothing to do with personal salvation. What Paul is saying is that God has every right to no longer recognize Israel as His chosen nation. He has every right to do that because He chose you to begin with. And if He chooses you, He can unchoose you. Parents, you ever told your children, I brought you in this world? I can take you out. That's what God said, essentially, in Romans chapter 9. I chose Israel as a nation. I can unchoose them. Illustration number three. Pharaoh. What a good one. Pharaoh's involvement in God's plan had nothing to do with Pharaoh's salvation. Let's imagine that Moses comes to Pharaoh at the first of the book of Exodus and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, okay. First of all, the book of Exodus is several chapters shorter. But does God's plan suffer at all for that? Absolutely not. Does Pharaoh's life change? Possibly. If at any point in those ten plagues, if Pharaoh had changed his mind earlier, Pharaoh's life would have changed, 
God's plan wouldn't have changed one bit. God's national choosing of Israel really had nothing to do with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was, was just a cog in it. God's choices nationally have nothing to do with individuals. It has everything to do with those nations. And that's what Romans 9 is all about. And here's the final illustration. Here is Romans chapter 9 and the potter and the clay. And I want you to pick up again in verse 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who's resisted his will? Well, how can we resist God's will? God's already chosen what's going to happen. And Paul says, Well, you can't. And why do you question God relative to his overall plan? The Jew says, Well, if God's going to choose Israel to be not his people anymore, then fine, I just give up. And God says, Wait a minute. You've always been the potter. And God has always been, or you, you've always been the clay, rather, and God's always been the potter. And He's going to use you as a nation however He sees fit. But when He's done with that pot, He has the right to choose another one. And under the new covenant, that's exactly what He's done. Does that mean the Jew is lost? Romans chapter 11 says absolutely not. But it means from a national standpoint, you are no longer the chosen group that God will focus on. Now it's the church. You see, and that fits perfectly with the context of Romans. It fits perfectly with the plain passages of the New Testament. It fits perfectly with Bible interpretation as everyone needs to practice it. But you've got to go there through the Word of God instead of picking and choosing what we want to build an ideology around. I hope that makes sense. So, we found our way through the, the, the twists and turns of an approach to a difficult passage, and it's brought us to these two fundamental lessons. Lesson number one, this is what Paul was trying to tell the Jewish Christian. God is always right. He's always right. When He chose Israel to be His nation, God was right. Did that mean the Gentiles were lost? No. It meant nationally He was focused on Israel. And now you fast forward thousands of years and God has unchosen Israel. Is God right to do that? Absolutely. God is always right. And you and I might want to take a step back and say, but, but God, I wish you'd do it this way. But God, I don't understand why you want us to do this or why you expect me to do that. God is always right. And if we're not careful, we can harbor the same attitudes as the Jewish Christians of the first century. God, I want you to do it this way. I think you should do it that way. And God says, no, I am the potter and you are the clay. That doesn't mean He chooses to smash people in, in, in eternal condemnation before they're ever born. That's not the context of Romans 9. What it means is God is in charge of His grand plan. And you can be, either be on His side or you can be against Him. But His plan is always right. And number two, every individual has the same chance. That's really the point of Romans 1-11. through Every individual is provided the same opportunity in Christ. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. What is the thesis of the book of Romans? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And what's the emphasis in that passage? Everyone. And he makes it clear, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's the thesis of the book of Romans. Everybody can be saved through the gospel. And that must be the emphasis for you and for me tonight. Everybody has the chance to be saved. But dear friends, let's never ever forget the converse to that. If everybody has the chance to be saved, then everybody has the chance to be lost. And dear friends, that's the same statement presented from two different perspectives. This evening, you and I have the same chance. Chance to be saved. 
or a chance to be lost. And how our lives turn out eternally is up to us. I hope you've gained some insight into number one, difficult passages, and number two, particularly into Romans chapter 9. But I hope more than anything you can gain some insight into your own soul. If you are not in a saved condition tonight, let's help you. What did those in the first century do, plainly and purely? If they believed in Christ, they changed their lives through repentance. They confessed their faith, and they were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. Over and over again, we see that. We start in Acts chapter 2. We move on to the book of Acts, and we see it over and over and over again. We see it plainly in Acts chapter 8. We, we move to Acts chapter 16. Over and over again, we see it laid before us as plain as day. This evening, do you need to do that? But maybe this evening you are a Christian. But maybe your life has not demonstrated that. Maybe you have taken for granted that you're in the church and there's not really much you need to do. Dear friends, that's the Jewish mindset the very one that Paul was condemning. And dear friend, do you need to make your life right before Christ tonight? Is there sin in your life? Obey the gospel and be restored tonight as together we stand and sing.